ashamed to say that I used to think that Durham was an industrial wilderness. What a nit I must have been. Look at that, Raby Castle. Fantastic place. Ancestral home of the Dukes of Cleveland, who seem to own everything in the valley. You can easily tell which are their places, because they're always painted white, conspicuous. Brilliant splashes of contrast among the mountain meadows. But which mountains, I hear you cry? Which valley is this, up which I trudge or drive? Well, this is Teesdale, on the eastern slopes of the Pennines, and I'm on my way to Middleton in Teesdale. And there it is, hardly noticeable, certainly not conspicuous. It's like a bit of the landscape, as if it had grown out of the rocks and the green fields. Which, of course, it has, because this is a stone town, built almost entirely of locally quarried sandstone, millstone grit, hazel in local parlance, or softer sandstone. This is the old part of the town. Plenty of 18th century cottages and houses, white painted raby ones over there. There are a couple of fragments of the very old church, the 14th century church. There's this window, and buried in here, round the corner, a nice sneaky fragment, a doorway with a shouldered lintel. And talking of being buried, what about this? Here's a roof that looks as if it's tired of roofiness. It's trying to turn itself back into a rock again. Or what about this one? Living rock, building his landscape. Or look at the pavement round here. Marvellous textures. It really is a town in which stone is used in the most satisfying of ways. And once again, river stones, volcanic stones, windstone, making this path along the river bank and used as coping to top the adjacent sandstone wall. And talking of coping, here's a glinter, a hard stone set against the bottom of the gatepost to stop carriage wheels damaging it. And here's another. It looks like a metal cogwheel. Another reminder of the days before motor cars when lanes like this echoed to the horses' hooves. There are lots of reminders of those days in Middleton. Just little reminders. Coal houses, wash house chimneys, sheds. How much the humble outbuildings add to the interest of the town. shown, I, I hope, that the town has grown out of its landscape. Well, there's another way in which that process has taken place here. These quartzite blocks are a reminder that the hills around here are mineral rich and that the town owes most of its wealth to mining. It was lead mining in these parts. In 1815, Middleton in Teesdale became a company town when the London Lead Company, a charitable organisation run by the Quakers, moved its headquarters here. They'd leased the mineral rights from the Duke of Cleveland at Raby, and they had a dramatic effect on the development of the town. Here, right at the top of the hill, in an appropriately elevated setting, was the superintendent's house. Quite plain, but beautifully built, the window surrounds in tooled and margined ashlar that almost indefinable sense of the sheer, well-built wall. This house was designed in 1823 by the County Durham architect Ignatius Bonamy, a contemporary of Newcastle's John Dobson, and a man just as famous at the time. He also built the lead depot next door to the superintendent's house. Nothing seems to have changed up here. The company moved out in 1906, but it all looks as if they moved out only yesterday. Lower down the hill, Bonamy designed a new town for the company. This is the top of it, Masterman Place. It's marked by this specially grand triumphal arch. 
It's a fantastic place. It's got a sort of diminutive grandeur, like Toy Town. Even the fire station looks like Trumpton, with Freddy the fire engine ready to leap into instant action. The company houses are characterised by their neatness, perfect stonework and hipped roofs. These ones on the middle ground, at the top of the new town, were for the middle men, the under-managers. To find the houses of the men who did the real work, you have to get right down to the bottom of the hill. But for all their good intentions, the London Lead Company operated a fairly grim paternalism. Children had to go to the company school. They had to go to church every Sunday. Miners weren't allowed to drink, and they could be sacked for swearing. There was good housing offered, but the wages were often the bare minimum. But having said all of that, there must be worse piles to be at the bottom of than the London Lead Company pile, because this is a beautiful place. And within their lights, the company did try to be different. Apart from the houses, they built a reading room for the workers. They encouraged the building of chapels. They provided a public water supply. And when their superintendent, Mr. Bainbridge, retired from the big house in 1877, the workers had a whip round and gave him this lovely drinking fountain. And the company built this school, another of my favourite buildings in the town, high Victorian Gothic of 1861, and still in an absolutely perfect state of preservation. But so is the rest of the town. It's, it really is a most undamaged town. I mean, look at this meadow here. It smells, it smells of childhood, and it's full of the sort of grasses that you used to pull the heads off and twirl in little girls' hair. And it's got whole families of cows, mummy cows, daddy cows, little baby cows. There's no factory farming in the meadows of Middleton. And these trees, they're like the town itself. They're not held in any sort of check by the iron corsets of their youth, but they haven't discarded them either. It's a timeless town, except for the clock on the lead company offices, which unlike 90% of the clocks in Newcastle, is still telling the right time. You've guessed it. Middleton is a town that's still ticking along very nicely. John Grundy in Middleton and Teesdale.